Sadalam, welcome to Outlier Academy. I am thrilled to have you on to dive into what you're building at Hone, which is uh, where you're focused on men's testosterone, helping men uh, be able to have healthy testosterone. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, I couldn't be more excited to talk to you and your audience, Daniel. So I want to start because, I mean, you have a super interesting background um, and I want to talk a little bit about the genesis of Hone and how you landed on this particular problem to solve. But can you first talk a little bit about just, you know, um, how you grew up and some of the, the, the foundation in your career early on that kind of led to eventually building Hone? And it's interesting because it all in this weird way comes full circle. Um, so I am, my parents are, I'm so I'm first generation Pakistani American. And so my, my father came here uh, from Pakistan in the seventies the and um, basically earned himself a PhD in particle physics at Stanford. He discovered multiple particles. And really as this, as this young boy, all he dreamt about was figuring out how to use physics to prove there was a God, right? And so that meant he was really smart. And he brought my mom here, married her, made her get an education when she didn't want to. And in our house, the thing that was important and only important was, how are your grades? Oh, you got a 98? Why not 100? And the reality is, right, as a young brown boy in an American country, all you actually really care about is if other kids in your class like you. You just want to fit in a lot. And so I was really lucky and blessed to have my parents push on me academically from a very young age. But the way I learned how to fit in was by playing sports. And uh, I was very awkward. I was horrible at the beginning. My parents could not help me out with it. But probably around the age of like 12 or 13, I fell in love with basketball and anything in general that required me to run around uh, and probably hit people a little bit. And so it just became a very big part of my, I would say, my, my character and identity. And so I went into a joint MD MPH program, not wanting to go at all, dropped the whole thing, actually finished off a graduate degree, ended up going to business school. And the reality is I hadn't learned how to think for myself completely yet at that point in time. I was still kind of caught in the, am I supposed to go do something in the medical or health field? And in large part, there's a deeply theological discussion around that, which is I believed I was buying my way to heaven by having impact in people's lives uh, in, this, in this very kind of like interesting manner. And it drove a large number of my decisions, frankly. And so I went into a pharmaceutical company. I was responsible for a $4 billion brand's marketing. Um, and frankly, when I got there, it was the wrong job for me. I had to take a, a, a drug that had recently been hit with a $2 billion fine by the FDA and figure out how to market it. It wasn't what I thought I was setting out to do. It wasn't altruistic, but God, was it a really good learning experience. Um, and eventually went to a, another healthcare startup. And then I, I built a company... And my first company was based upon my brother having difficulty writing and almost dropping out of college. And so we ended up building an enterprise level writing platform, sold to large districts, ran that for five years, ended up selling the company. And to give you some more background on myself and kind of like how the early, I'd say, athleticism played into my life, I've worked out six days a week for the past 25 years of my life. I eat perfectly. I meditate twice a day. I track my sleep with multiple devices. I have a massive spreadsheet. I've got every device you can probably imagine in my office, in my living room. And it's just a very big part of my character. And when I turned 35 several years ago, a bunch of problems started hitting me. The first one was my energy level started to decrease. All of a sudden, it would be like 2 o'clock. I'd want to take a nap, which is the complete opposite of my personality. I could feel my mental acuity and my stamina starting to slip. I couldn't recall very simple facts. I couldn't do simple math in my head like I used to. And then all of a sudden, I started to gain quite a bit of weight, right? And I got those dreaded love handles uh, that everyone hates. And, and then all of a sudden, my libido was gone. And that was really the straw that broke the camel's back because... I was sleeping right, I was eating right, I was optimizing and doing all the things I was supposed to, to to make sure that I was at the top of my game. But the reality is that all of a sudden, I'm asking myself really dark questions. Is this the beginning of me turning old? My father started having real health problems right around the age of 35. Will I be able to provide for my family? Will I be able to chase after my dreams and build another company? And so you start asking yourself these questions that frankly, without the right answer, they become like the self-defeating negative feedback cycle in your mind of you kind of just chipping away at your confidence. And so I went to my primary care physician who at that point was a concierge level doc. So I'd argue like a pretty good physician. 
he takes my my biomarkers, he brings me back, and he literally says, Saad, you're a shining example of health. There's nothing wrong with you. But you know what? I see Middle Eastern men starting to age a little bit earlier. So this could be the could be the beginning of old age. And frankly, you're a little bit kind of obsessive. And so it could just be this millennial existential angst that's getting you. And I was like, are you are you thinking yeah, that God? I'm so happy that you went to and did seven years of med school to, to tell me that. Um, and I said, I don't buy it. I'm so in tune with my body that there's no way that this is happening. And then I started seeing different specialists. And it took me about six months of seeing, I'd say, 10 or 11 different physicians until I finally met a group of hormone optimization and regenerative physicians. They took a look at that same blood work. And they said, Saad, you had the testosterone levels of an 80-year-old man. Now, on one hand, you're completely relieved because you're like, yes, I know exactly what the problem is. On the other hand, you hear the T word and you have these images of Frank Thomas or these late night infomercials. And so you say to yourself, wow, well, I don't know if that's the boat I want to be in. Now, the thing they said next gave me a lot of comfort. They said a large majority of our patients are younger guys just like you. And that kind of set this tripwire of going, well, that doesn't make sense. Why are there a bunch of 35-year-old guys running around with hormone problems? And when you start digging into the research, and this is going to sound incredibly conspiratorial, what you find is that our father's generation had 25% more testosterone and our fathers had 50% more sperm. And that the, the reason for it is that there are all these environmental contaminants, the plastics, the PCBs, the phthalates, they get into our food and our drinking water, the deodorants we use, and they essentially tell our body's natural hormone production cycle to cease, or the other way to say it is to stop endogenous production. And so when I first read it, I was like, oh my God, this sounds like something like The Handmaid's Tale, like a, like a Showtime movie. And then you start digging into it and you realize like, actually, this is very, very real. And you start to understand how the hormone or the HPA cycle in your body works. And you're like, wow, this is like a very disturbing thing. And even more disturbing is that a lot of these changes are what they call epigenetic. So they can be passed on to your offspring. So theoretically, the next generation, if you had lower testosterone or hormone problems, could inherit that from you. And so I went on treatment and it changed my life, right? Like so much so that I would not be here today. I'd not be building a company if I hadn't figured out how to get my energy and my confidence back. And so I said, all right, I know what the next one is. Yeah. A focus, a company completely focused on testosterone. <laughs> I want to go back uh, to one of the things that you touched on there that I think is really interesting. Um, and then there's a million questions I want to ask you after that, but just really quickly, you know, when you talk about following some of your parents and, you know, ambitions, which, which everybody struggles with. We all grow up in a household. You are taught some things, some, you know, a lot of us grow up in a household where there's much more modeling or there's the expectation you're going to model. And so one of the things I want to ask is, you know, going through some of those experiences, whether it was going to medical school, being in this first job where you learned a lot, but you hated it. What do you feel like you really took away from those experiences? Was it just learning to listen to yourself and do what you want to do? Was there a deeper lesson what, what, what did you take away from those moments? I guess there, there are a lot of them. Uh, like the first dimension of it is in our culture and religion, there's like God, your parents, and everything else. And so generally, if your parents want something for you, and granted, right, your parents actually do admit, suggest everything out of love. So they actually truly want the best thing for you. What they think is the best thing for you is also boxed by what they believe or how they believe the world operates. And so generally, if you are an immigrant coming here, you've come because you are a engineer, you're a doctor, probably maybe not really a lawyer. And so generally, those are like the two boxes they want to put you in. And they want you to go into the one that seems the most prestigious and makes the most money. And then there's also this concept of like your community or people of your religion that you grew up around your aunts and uncles would be very disappointed in you if you did something other than that. And so as I got a little bit older, I had to really understand and like pull the two of them apart, which is I can exercise my free will. And if I make the decision that's best for myself based upon what I know, and I'm the closest to myself, no one's going to care. Like they're still going to love you. And so I think that was the first thing I had to pull apart. I think the, the other thing too is, and I tell people this all the time, you don't have to know what you want to do 
But what you have to do is you have to pick an end goal for one year or two years, and you got to sprint to it with as much energy as you can muster and be fully committed to it. And generally, once you get there, you don't want to give up too early. So much of, of it is about the discipline and the determination to make sure you can follow a plan that you put in place for yourself, because that's really the muscle that you're building. And then once you get there, you can say, okay, I've accomplished this, right? And you're on top of this little perch or this mountain that you've climbed, and you can look around and say, what's the next one I actually want to climb? And I think that what you find so many people doing is they almost get paralyzed because they think that if they make a career decision or they start to move one way, they're stuck there. And I tell them, no, the most beautiful thing about life is you can make it whatever the hell you want it to be. And so once I decided I'm not going to not gonna finish up with, with med school, at first I told my parents, and you know, the funniest thing, I had worked up all this courage and I sat them down at the dining table and I, I tell them and they're like, and all my dad says is, but how are we going to get you married? <laughs> and and it's it's interesting because like that was the thing that he was so afraid of. And I was like, listen, don't worry, I'm, I'm gonna get married. Don't worry. Like that's that's gonna happen. And and I think that very often what you think is gonna be the thing that holds you back, it really isn't at the end of the day, because the way you're you're perceiving or framing something is very different than the other party. And I, I'd also say too that when I went to work at Lilly. Right, I was a 26-year-old with a huge budget, with a huge responsibility. Even though it wasn't the job that made me happy, am I grateful for that experience? Because I learned how to run market research. I learned how to make sure I validate large markets. And that became a foundational piece of my learning. And I applied it every single other place throughout my career. And I got the learning, well, this wasn't really for me. Even though the money was great, I was satisfied. I drove a nice car at that age. I was like, this doesn't really make me happy. And then it also teaches you to really be in tune with the things that make you happy once you've reached those kind of, I'd say, those initial peaks of your life early on. But you got to run after them. I always tell people that if, you, if you're if you going to be wishy-washy, you're just going to end up floating around and not doing anything. Yeah. No, so well said. I heard, uh, I was talking with a friend recently who worked in uh, intelligence uh, for the Air Force and, and, and for the Defense Department. And he told me about this quote that apparently the Air Force uses where it's all thrust, no vector. Just this idea that it's basically a lot of motion, but no directionality. And I love your point about, you know, you one, you need to pick a direction. Two, you need to sprint in it. And then there's a bunch of soft skills that you're learning about how to be disciplined, about how to think about strategy, about how to just literally do the day-to-day -day job of, you know, kind of moving the ball forward. And then once you get there, you can always reassess. But I love the way, yeah, I love the framework with which you talk about that. Um, I'd love to kind of wade a little bit into testosterone and what you're building at, at Hone. But I want to start first by talking about, you know, I know Hone is a very mission-driven company for you. How do you talk about that mission? And is that any different than how you just describe what you're building to your friends and your family? Whenever you're building something, you actually choose like a entry point that you think is, 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 easy to to penetrate and to scale to demonstrate that something actually works before you work out to your larger mission. Now, the, when people, I talk to people at parties and they say, what do you do? Um, I could say, I have a hormone optimization company that sells kits and provides testosterone to people. What I actually say I do is I say, I help men have confidence as they age, right? And that generally is actually what we do at the end of the day. I don't sell a bunch of medications. I give people momentum in their life so they can take momentum and create change and figure out how to be happy. And I would say like the other very real undertone of the company that's beginning to come out, I believe we're about the same age, right? And I bet you a lot of our listeners are men or women. I think that we will live until we're 110 or 120. I almost think it is a foregone conclusion. I don't think it's any woo-woo. I watched my father live an additional 20 years on medical advances when he should have passed away when he was 45 or 50, right? And so I think so many things are happening underneath our feet right now that we're not even aware of it because by the time we get there, it'll just have happened. And so I think if you take your mind and you begin assuming, right, I'm 40, I'll live until let's even say 110. That means I'll have 60 really good years of life ahead of me. Forget about the 10 really crappy years. And what it forces you to do is you fundamentally take the arc of your life that your parents probably had, you stretch it out, and you redefine it. And I think a lot of people don't realize that's the world we're living in. So when I meet a 60-year-old and they're like, oh, God, I feel so tired. I'm going to retire. And I was like, why? 
like 60 is super young right now, right? And and when you can make the shift, it's almost like being given a gift. And what I mean by that is at the age of 40 now, right? I feel like I'm in my 20s. I feel like I because I believe I'll live so much longer, it's almost like I'm 18 years old with maybe the experience, the bank account of a 40-year-old, and I can sprint at life just as hard as I would when I was 20, except with a whole lot more direction. And so I think that the the undertone is we help people have confidence as they age. We're going to be doing, we're going to be building this for women as well, too. And what we're really trying to do is give you the playbook to live as long as you possibly can, but be as healthy and then more importantly, as happy, right? Because we went going back to that, that hope, that large piece of it is mindset. And so in large part, probably the life you live, probably the life I live, what we are doing is trying to figure out how to scale that for the everyday person that doesn't have access to maybe some of the doctors you and I have access to or some of the, the tools we have access to. Because the reality is that you can actually do a lot of those things without spending a lot of money. And so that's generally the way I describe it to people. We give people confidence. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about testosterone and maybe pause for a moment and do testosterone 101. And I know you are, you know, not a testosterone doctor, although you've spent a lot of time studying a lot of stuff, obviously, in this area. The question that I wanted to ask was if you could kind of just lay out what testosterone is and why it matters. Because obviously you talk about confidence. That would, you know, I assume that that would be the meta benefit you get by having, you know, healthy levels of testosterone. But, you know, I also know that when your testosterone's low, it leads to low energy that obviously, you know, shows up in extra fat stored on your body. You can work out less. You have less intensity during physical activity. So talk, like, why is that? And maybe frame up a little bit of what testosterone is and how it works. Okay. So let me actually... Let me describe the problem we solve, and then I'll talk about how testosterone works in a biological perspective and even how it mechanically works in your body. So first thing is, right? Most people believe that when guys are coming to us, they're saying, I want bigger muscles and I want better sex. Those are all positive benefits. But the reality is that guys are coming to us and they're saying, I can't get on the ground and play with my kids anymore. I can't have a real relationship with my partner or spouse because I can't sit down and have the patience to have a real conversation. They say, I can't earn more money for the people I love because I can't go to work and focus so I can get that promotion, right? So these are like deep identity-based issues that our guys are coming to us with. Now, that being said, there are testosterone receptors on every one of the cells in your body. And testosterone works differently in different cells. But maybe the punchline is if you have low testosterone, you have energy problems, you have focus problems, you gain weight, you can have libido problems. It's highly misdiagnosed as being depressed. So there are a lot of antidepressants given out to men every single year when it's really just a hormone imbalance. Uh, It also leads to higher rates of dementia if you have low testosterone. It leads to more brittle bones. And so the most interesting research that's come out recently is that Previously, what people thought is that if you take testosterone, you have a higher chance of cardiovascular disease. The more recent research is showing if you are hypogonadal, that is the the clinical term for having low testosterone, and you take testosterone, you have fewer comorbidities, you have fewer cardiovascular events, you have lower rates of diabetes, lower rates of depression. And so the most important thing to think about is If you think about like the energy and vigor you had in your 20s, and then by the time you get into your 30s, it slows down just a little bit, but just subtly, not not in a very real way. And then by the time you hit your 40s, your 50s, you really feel like you've started to kind of lose that extra step. And that extra step can manifest itself in so many different ways based upon your personality. You have to start thinking to yourself, if I wanted to feel like I did when I was younger, I would probably want to replace this hormone now. Let me give you the, the, the biology lesson. And I'm very happy you pointed that out. I am not a medical physician. And so this is not, uh, this is not clinical physician advice. So what ends up happening is you have this little gland in your brain. And so imagine if you were to draw a line between your eyes into the base of your skull, and that little gland is called your hypothalamus. And underneath your hypothalamus, you have your pituitary gland. And imagine the two of those structures combined are like a thermostat for all the hormones in your body. Now, what ends up happening is you have this this hormone that is secreted from your pituitary gland. It is called luteinizing hormone. That luteinizing hormone travels through your body into your testes. And in your testes, you have these cells called Leydig cells. 
and it basically activates them. And once they are activated, there is testosterone that is produced. Now, the testosterone does one of three things, actually four things. The first thing is it is what we'll call free testosterone, and it is available for your body's cells to use in whatever function they need to use that testosterone. That's like the most positive one. The second one is there is what we call a bunch of SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, in your body and albumin. And it basically finds that testosterone and it hugs it or it binds it so it can't be useful in your body. The other two things are very interesting. Your testosterone converts into what they call DHT. And so DHT is actually a far more anabolic hormone, or most people actually know it as the, the hormone that's responsible for men's hair loss if you are predisposed to it. The fourth thing it does is it converts into estrogen. And so estrogen, all men have it. It's actually very good for us. Not obviously at elevated levels, but having some in your body is incredibly protective. Now, what ends up happening is that testosterone and that estrogen travel through your body and then your hypothalamus and your pituitary, they sense how much you have of it. And based upon how much you have of it, it tells them to either secrete more or less LH, there's also FSH, but primarily really LH is the one that we really focus on. And so as you get older, let's call it from 30 onwards, your body begins losing its natural ability to produce one to two percentage points of testosterone per year. And so with that, the way that really manifests itself is those Leydig cells we talked about in your testes, just imagine they slowly start to shut off. And so by the time you're 40, you have lost the ability for your body to naturally produce 10 to 20% of what you could produce when you were in your 30s, by the time you're in your 50s, 30 to 40%. And so based upon what your hormone markers look like, your age, and also your fertility desires, our physicians can actually get a pretty accurate reading and understanding of what we should do to help restore you back to youthful levels. I mean, that's fascinating. Thank you for that For that overview. You did a much more thorough job than I kind of expected. Sorry. No, sorry, no, that I was amazing. <laughs> uh, no, it's amazing. That's what I love. I want to ask a couple stupid questions. And one of the stupid questions that I wanted to ask was, you know, I'm sure a lot of men come and uh, just think, okay, I have low testosterone, but maybe if I just go harder in the gym, maybe if I just lift heavier or do more cardio, you know, there's natural things I can do to elevate my testosterone. I would imagine that's probably true, but it, it, you know, it can't, uh, you know, make up for the deficit that they might have in testosterone. Talk a little bit about like, are there natural things that people can do and what are the limitations there? Oh my God. Yes. So thank I'm very happy you brought this up. What we always tell people to do, and we give them a bunch of lifestyle counseling alongside of this. And this is also important because I don't want people to think we're a testosterone mill that gives testosterone to anyone. You actually have to be clinically proven to have testosterone deficiency in two separate occasions in order to even qualify for a treatment. And so there are a bunch of guys up, out there that are upset that we don't qualify them because frankly, they don't qualify. But this is important. These are going to be the simplest things you can do to make sure your testosterone is optimized. Get seven to eight hours of sleep. Don't smoke. Don't drink. Cut the excess sugars or refined carbohydrates out of your diet. Don't play on your phone too much before you go to sleep so there's not excessive blue light until late more late hours of the morning because that disturbs your circadian rhythm, which doesn't allow you your body to, to heal as well. Make sure you drink enough water every day. Exercise. Do stress management. If you want their supplements like fenugreek, ashwagandha, are they an absolute silver bullet? No, not at all. But will they help your body naturally improve it? And do they have research-backed efficacy studies to demonstrate they work? Yes. Also very important to understand that, Daniel, what your body may need versus what my body may need to naturally improve our testosterone levels, very different based upon the individual. And another easy one, uh, if you haven't been doing compound exercises, squats, deadlifts, or bench presses that activate some of the bigger muscles in your body, you probably should because those can also help improve your testosterone levels naturally. The limitations are, there are a couple of limitations. First one being is if you are one of those guys that has very low LH levels because maybe you live in an urban area, there's a ton of pollution and they've naturally been depressed because there's kind of so many of these estrogenic plastics running around in your body. You can do a lot of those things, but it's really not going to improve it the way you need to because there's probably some medical intervention that's necessary. The second way that's also a little bit harder, 
let's say that your body's Leydig cells have started to shut off a little bit prematurely or they're accelerated due to your genetics, no matter how much of that stuff you do, there will probably always be a deficit. And in those cases, you have to take testosterone exogenously. Yeah, it's fascinating. Another stupid question that I would ask is, you know, you talk about when you talk about lose, you know, men losing testosterone and this fact that from the time you're 30 to the time you're 40, you've lost say 30 to 40%. You know, it's that power of compounding where it's a small number every single year, but then you <laughs> multiply that over a decade. It's a pretty big departure. You know, when I hear those numbers, it certainly sounds alarming that decade by decade, you're losing another third, another third over your ability. Is there any, are there, is there anything negative about having elevated testosterone levels at as you age? Because, you know, just at a high level, it sounds like, well, why shouldn't everybody have more testosterone as they age to help with things like bone brittleness, mental acuity, all of those things? There's a threshold, right? Uh, meaning like generally, and this is a little bit archaic because it's based upon population studies that also are kind of looking at bell curve distributions, but generally a healthy testosterone level is between 900 and 300 nanograms per deciliter regardless of age. That's not a true, it shouldn't be a true statement, but that is a true statement according to the medical community. And so some guys will naturally run at 1200. Some guys will naturally run at 1800. Some guys may run at 2000. I met a guy at a conference that ran at 2100 naturally, right? And I think that one, you have to understand what is the trend line of your life. Did you normally run at 2100 and now you're running at 1200? That's a 900 point decrease. And for you, even though you're above the threshold, it's probably unhealthy. Or I would say it's you're, you're feeling the effects of low testosterone and you should be elevated versus someone else might naturally run at 400. And if you took them from 400 to like a 12 or 1300, you probably put them into a little bit of a red zone. I want to make sure that I say that there is, there's a gray area here based upon the individual. If your testosterone level is too high, it can actually present some longer term healthcare problems if they're not supposed to be there. And when I say not supposed to be there, once again, you have to look at the trend line and think about where you were previous in your life. There are certain side effects, right? And this is really important. A lot of what we spend our time doing, we, are, we kind of like call ourselves the most conservative clinic out there. About 15 to 20% of guys, they have an elevated hematocrit number after they take testosterone. It is the overproduction of red blood cells. Now, one could say that doesn't seem like a big deal because when you live in elevated parts of the world, you have more red blood cells to help you carry more oxygen. That's actually what a lot of runners do. But the problem is when you have a elevated hematocrit level, you theoretically could have more cardiovascular events, or if you had an operation, you could bleed out a little bit easier. And so I'm one of those guys. Every six months, I have to go donate a liter of blood, right? And that's the easiest way you solve it. And that would kind of be like the biggest issue, which is you, if your testosterone levels are elevated too high for a prolonged period of time, there could be some real cardiovascular events that could happen. Yeah. I want to ask uh, maybe one more question and then talk a little bit about the patient experience for someone going through hone. But the, the question that I want to ask was, um, you know, are there any, just to ask the, again, it's probably a stupid question, but I, I want to ask all the kind of inverse questions. So we talked about, you know, having healthy testosterone and obviously some of the issues that can come if it's more, you know, if it's some of the risks of being more elevated. On the flip side, are there any benefits to being low testosterone? <laughs> and I know it's a dumb question. I'll say this. I actually don't think I can speak intelligently, or I would say fact-based on whether having low testosterone is good. But what I can say is, if you have low testosterone, let's say you're underneath that 300 nanograms per deciliter threshold, but you do not have symptoms, meaning you don't have low energy, meaning you don't have libido problems, meaning you, you, you can focus fine, you shouldn't worry about it. And it's really important that people don't just chase the number that the physician is giving you, that they kind of holistically take a look at what's happening with their life right now and think about, is this something I actually want to spend time optimizing? If there's no problem, there's no problem, there's no problem. And I'll, I'll maybe even use myself as an example. I learned that I had a testosterone level of about 180 nanograms per deciliter, which is very, very low. I went to 400 on my first go around using a fertility drug that naturally increased my testosterone level. I felt good, but I felt like I could feel a little bit better. And that's so much of what we do is helping people think through the qualitative aspect of this. I then went to 600. I felt absolutely wonderful. And then I said, doc, fuck it. Let's go to, let's go. Sorry. I shouldn't have swore. No, you go for it. <laughs> uh, okay, good. 
I said, let's go to 800. Then let's go to 1200. And the problem is the higher I went, I had to be very honest. I just felt overstimulated and I didn't like it. And so interestingly, my sweet spot is between 600 and 650. And that's where I keep my testosterone because after two years of playing with it enough, I said, that's where I want to be. And that's where I feel more comfortable. Yeah. It's so interesting. Um, So I want to talk about kind of before we go any further, pause for a second and talk about the patient experience of hone. Because so we've, you know, we've talked about obviously just a couple of assumptions that may not be true. So you can push back on these, but I'm guessing people are finding out about hone thinking, well, maybe I have low testosterone or I think I do. Maybe I have some of these symptoms. I have you know, mentally foggy. I'm starting to get, you know, a little bit more fat on my body. I'm not super confident. They go and look out hone and land on your webpage from there through kind of getting set up with the treatment. And again, you said you're the most conservative clinic. So it sounds like not everybody obviously gets approved. What does that experience look like? And, uh, and then we can talk about some of the pros and cons and you know, go into a little bit deeper. So let me quickly take a second and pause on the, the experience I went through, which is indicative of the problem a lot of other people go through. They're 35, 40, 45, 50 years old. Their primary care physician laughs them out of the room or tells them they have depression and they go, holy crap, that's horrible. Maybe they take an antidepressant. or Maybe they don't listen to the physician. They then kind of go through five or 10 more years of kind of just slowly and progressively getting worse, thinking it's just old age. They finally go to a specialist. That specialist tells them to get their blood done. They've got to go somewhere else to get their blood done. They've got to go to another specialist because that first specialist wasn't going to be able to help them. And they kind of ping pong around the healthcare system until they finally find someone that says you have low testosterone. But very often they're going to say, I won't treat it because they don't get reimbursed enough. And so you end up at a testosterone clinic, right? All the things that are wrong. (laughs) all all (laughs) All the things that are wrong. There's no coordination of care. There's no one that's really looking over your back to make sure that you get the best care. And then what ends up happening is if you go to a testosterone clinic or even your physician's office, you're going in generally every single week or two times a week for a shot. Just a horrible experience. It takes a ton of time. So the way we do it is you basically purchase a kit from us for $45. Kit goes out to you. You prick your finger and you're going to give us eight drops of blood on what looks like a fancy piece of filter paper. You're going to give us those drops of blood and you're going to send it to one of our labs. Our lab's going to analyze that for eight different hormones. Once the hormones have been analyzed and assuming that your sample came out fine, which comes out fine about 94% of the time, we then do a 30-minute audiovisual consult, which is basically just a FaceTime consult with a hormone optimization physician that is licensed, right? So they are either endos, euros, hormone optimization specialist, someone that has to have had 10 to 15 years of experience specifically with this particular problem. You spend the first 10 minutes just talking about yourself, right? And it's actually a very cathartic kind of event for a lot of guys because they've held so much of this inside of them and they've never had a chance to express how they're feeling. And our physicians really try pulling. The next 10 minutes are spent, well, here are your biomarkers and let me educate you on what's happening in your body. Then the last 10 minutes are, well, here are your different treatment options. If you don't qualify for testosterone, you don't qualify for testosterone. It is what it is. But there are other ways that we can help you. We're also now getting into longevity medications. We're getting to other energy medications. And so maybe we can help you there. But then let's say you qualify for testosterone and you actually want a controlled substance, highly regulated. Some other clinics will just send it out to you. We say, I know you're going to hate this, but we're going to ask you to do another blood test. So then you have to do another blood test, give us a little bit more blood. And basically we check to see, is your testosterone low in a second reading? And also we take a look at all the safety markers. Is this safe for you to take? We then make sure the medication gets sent out to you. Every 30 days, you get a new script of testosterone. So there isn't the ability to abuse it. And then on the 90th day, you actually have to do another at-home blood test, or you can go to a lab core followed by another physician consult that is an audiovisual consult, right? And we do that every 90 days for the first year. And once we've quote unquote dialed you in and you figured out what works for yourself, then we reduce it to 60 days. But it is a very intensive handholding kind of exercise that we go through with our patients. And I know just looking at the site that there's different ways that people can take testosterone. I know obviously you talked about getting injections. It looks like there's even some stuff that you can take like a pill. I may be getting that wrong, but talk about some of the different ways that people can, I guess, ingest or take testosterone. So we have three formulations. First formulation is a subcutaneous injection that's delivered essentially through an insulin pen. It's what diabetics you use. You go into the subcutaneous fat of your belly, painless. I did mine this morning. Second way is what they call a trochee. That's the little pill that you're referring to. 
It is an under the tongue sublingual pill that kind of tastes like a starburst. You put it under your tongue or maybe you put it in your gum. Or the third one is a cream you put on the inside of your arms. Maybe you put it on your testes. That's where it's absorbed the best. Now, I always ask people this. What are the proportions that you sell that you think we sell of each? It's a good question. I would guess not as much of the needles and I would guess a lot of the creams and uh, lozenge. <laughs> Everyone, well, hold on, I'll say that. We were we guessed that too. We said the most invasive one is the one we should sell the most of. It's actually the opposite. Ninety-five to ninety-six percent of what we sell are subcutaneous injections. Wow, is it more effective? Interestingly, the creams are the most efficacious. But the problems with the creams is you've got to put them on at night or in the morning. And the other problem is that there's like this concept of transference. So like if you have a child and you put it on your arms and you're playing with your child, like they can get on your child and your child can grow a mustache. Or <laughs> if you know, you're probably not great. I, well, yeah. <laughs> when you have a four-year-old <laughs> running around with a full beard, uh, sometimes your wife could grow a mustache as well too. Uh, if you if you have a partner, it's probably a little bit different. You probably want, want everyone having more testosterone. But most guys opt for the injection because it provides the single most stable concentration in your blood, and you only have to inject usually once a week, sometimes twice, but really with those insulin pins, you don't really feel it. So I'd love to talk a little bit, you know, you, you, you walked us through your example of what you felt like before and what you felt like after, you know, and you talked about this kind of six month period where you were going through those initial changes and it sounds like you kind of optimized it further from there, but maybe walk us through kind of two things. One would be how much time being treated does it take for someone to really start to see and feel the differences? And then two, what are you, what are like the most common deltas of before and after and how big of a delta is that for most men? So let me give you, I'm going to give you my personal example because my personal path was a little bit different than most, but I can speak to it because I can see, I, we see the data and talk to patients every day. So when I initially got on, I opted to go on a fertility drug called Clomid that actually naturally increases that LH signal because of my age, because I actually believe that less is more. And I think most people don't realize it, that you want to take the least amount of any medication that you have to in order for it to be just successful enough. Because the moment you take too much, the cells in your body start to downregulate, and then you have to actually take more of that medication. So I went on Clomid. And so Clomid took about a month and a half to work. And it started with me sleeping a little bit better. And then I started to notice that I had a little bit more energy. But honestly, it was a very gentle feeling. Uh, and it took it took a long time. I then switched from Clomid probably about six months in to subcutaneous testosterone injections. The average testosterone dosage that our physicians provide patients to get started is about 100 milligrams per week. I take 50 milligrams per week. And just to give you a point of comparison, if you were a bodybuilder trying to get jacked for a competition, you'd probably be taking 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams per week. So right, you're talking about 5% to 10% of what a bodybuilder would actually take in a very carefully controlled uh, environment. Now, most other guys that just start strictly on testosterone, they will swear that within two weeks, they're feeling differences. And we can pull out testimonial after testimonial of guys that literally say, I always thought my life was over. And now I'm literally at the point where I feel like I have a second wind back in my life. So that's that's your first question. Now, in terms of the data, right? It's interesting. When I go out to, to raise capital, people always say, so you're building a testosterone clinic in the cloud. I said, absolutely wrong. We are building what is arguably the most complex and sophisticated longitudinal patient management system in the cloud. And so because we get biomarkers at the beginning, a lot of self-validated questionnaires from the patients, we can begin looking at what do the deltas look like over time. So generally, and this is on average, I'm putting this in air quotes, a patient comes to us and they have a starting testosterone level of about 280 nanograms per deciliter. Over the course of six months of treatment, they usually go from a 280 to about a 620, right? So you're talking about a 340 point delta. But then the other thing that we track, which is even more important, is something called a Q Adam score. A Q Adam score is a validated questionnaire that they use in urological settings to determine uh, how you feel kind of as a man, the strength of your erection when you're having uh, intercourse, um, the how often you sleep after you eat, how much energy you have in the day. The Q Adam score on average increases about 22%, right? Which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually a massive number. 
The other number that we track, and this is, we got very lucky that we decided to do this at the beginning, is a PHQ-9 score. And so a PHQ-9 score is a depression-related score. And so what you actually see is on average, a guy's depression score improves by about 30% over that period of time as well too, right? And so as much as I like the testosterone number, I kind of care more about the qualitative measures of how your life has improved more than anything. Yeah, it's huge. You talked to, I'm going to leap ahead for a second. Um, you know, you talked about at the beginning that right now you're doing this for men, obviously testosterone, you know, I love the way you framed up the beginning testosterone for a lot of men is something, you know, about something you don't really talk about. It seems like mostly shady infomercials or the things that at the gas station near the counter, all the weird looking pills <laughs> that you can buy to try to, to try to boost it is kind of a taboo topic. Um, you know, you, and so you're focused on men for right now, but you talked about ultimately, um, you know, also expanding to be able to focus on women. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about like, I assume you haven't gotten there yet, but one of the things I'm curious about is does estrogen have the same input into confidence that it does for men and, or is it just a very different type of hormone? And is it completely different in terms of how that feels and how that changes as women age? So unfortunately I can't speak intelligently to it because, uh, I'd say that I don't know how it feels in me, and I don't think that we have enough clinical experience yet in that particular area. The The only thing I can say is that the way doctors will describe men versus women is men are dense and they are binary. Uh, and what I mean by that is that when you treat a man, it's like an on and off switch. You literally switch it on, you switch it off. When you're When you're treating women because they're so much more in tune with their emotions and have so much more clarity over how they're feeling, and because you're also modulating not just estrogen, but four other hormones, it is far more of like a knob turning game that requires a lot more refinement than with a man. And so there is a different infrastructure, a different care delivery model that has to be delivered. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I will be very excited once you've rolled that out to be able to have you back on and we can talk talk about that side of the business. Um, I, I want to ask a couple more questions around uh, kind of, you know, as I was preparing for this interview, one of the things that was very clear is that Hone is a very clear example of what the future of healthcare looks like or what the future of, you know, health management, because I feel like healthcare is kind of a polluted word <laughs> at this point. It doesn't really mean what most people, it has a lot of baggage with it. You know, you talked about the experience you went through, of uh, which is obviously far from ideal. I mean, it's at literally an absolute disaster to go to your doctor and then have to ping pong between different specialists and no one wants to treat you. You have to have an enormous amount of willpower just to kind of like push through that and end up getting to a solution. You know, so you have that moment, you start thinking about how you might do that differently with hone. One of the things I was curious about is what was very clear in your mind that you wanted to do differently from day one, meaning before you founded the company, what were some really strong ideas you had about what the patient experience should look like and feel like, and have any of those changed? Or do you feel like you were directionally pretty spot on in terms of what needed to change in the way men were treated in regards to testosterone? I think that the biggest problems we sought out to solve were as a as a busy adult, it is very difficult to go to multiple places and to coordinate all the different care that you were getting, right? I would argue that just frankly, the time you spent driving to a physician's office, waiting in a physician's office, speaking to them, and granted, right? When you speak to them, these are three or four minute conversations. You're out the door. You've got to go give your blood somewhere else. You're waiting for that result to come back because the doctor wants to get reimbursed more. You're going back to the office to have that consult. If you're going to a specialist, you're then getting a specialist recommendation. You're then waiting two or three weeks, maybe a month for a specialist appointment if they're even taking new people and you got to get there, right? The whole cycle repeats itself. And the reality is the moment the, the primary care physician lets you go, you're done, right? And so if you were to call your primary care physician and say, I have a question, they'd be like, I just saw 300 patients today. Like, what am I supposed to do? 300 is being crazy. Like realistically, like I saw 150 patients, like it's sort of kind of remember you. And I, I would argue, right. The healthcare system, when you are generally with your practitioner, because they care, they're generally very good moments, but it's getting to those moments that take a lot of time that are difficult. And the other thing, the conclusion I've come to is where healthcare breaks down is in the transition from provider to provider and the way information gets passed on in a way that is quick for the other person to consume, digest, and then do something useful with. And so what we really sought out, as you said, we want it to be the most inconvenient experience so you can do it while you're in the comfort of your home. You don't have to go into a physician's office. And 
we actually openly acknowledge that in order to change the care model to the way that we want it to eventually become, you've got to take physicians that understand hormones, let them initially give their 10 or 15 minute consults, watch what they're doing and say, no, we want you to insert this next piece of information. We want you to bring in this next question. We want you to change the experience this way a little bit. And I'm, I'm very lucky because the team I have, my co-founders are all kind of like, I'll say, have scaled companies, very large, all have healthcare experience, care deeply about it. And we're all consumers ourselves of it. And so a large part of what you're going to see, or you're going to see how you're going to see the company evolve is, right? We just started adding longevity medications, which most physicians don't know how to prescribe. Uh, We're focusing primarily on how do we give you more energy, right? So you can do something useful with it. And the next kind of bolt on is People think that testosterone is a very easy and linear therapeutic category to treat, right? I go get my blood test, I get my meds, I get my next blood test. It is arguably the single most difficult telehealth business to build bar none. I know I'm all inside and out, and it's because of the at-home testing component, making sure you get the patient to be compliant, sending controlled medications, titrating every 90 days. It is an absolute mess that we've spent $2 million building a custom EMR just to make sure we can handle patients. Now, the beauty of it is once you spend two years going through the difficult process of figuring out all the paper cuts of the business and fixing them with a technological solution... You then say, okay, what's the next therapeutic category that's really hard and how do we combine them? And so the next one we'll go after is thyroid, right? Another eight biomarkers. Then it is medically assisted weight loss. And so really the way healthcare should look is, Daniel, you come in as a patient, right? You're not a medical professional. We can't expect you to be. All you can tell us is, tell me how you're not feeling good. Well, I'm feeling tired. I'm feeling like I'm a little bit depressed. Maybe I've got a BMI that's three points higher than it should be. I'm carrying some fat around my waist. And it should be our job to say, okay, normally you'd have to go to six different specialists to go treat those problems. Don't worry about it. Let us collect all your biomarkers and let us make sure that we have the internal expertise to understand all the nuances of those biomarkers. And then let's put together a program that is sequential in nature, which slowly pulls off each of the symptoms in a way that provides you with the least amount of treatment necessary. Versus you going to this doctor and this doctor and this doctor and this doctor and getting four or five different medications. And that's really the way we're beginning to move because at the end of the day, our goal is to get you symptom relief as fast as possible so you can just get on with your damn life. Yeah. I mean, I love that framing in terms of what the experience should look like because I definitely agree. You know, and one of the, I've interviewed quite a few founders in this space. Uh, recently, you know, I talked with uh, Adrian, who's the founder of, uh, of Forward, um, who also has a lot of just really interesting ideas and is kind of at the forefront of creating this new version of healthcare. But one of the things that's fascinating is, you know, there's kind of sick care, which is really, I think, what we have today, which is, the, the you know, the, our medical establishment uh, does a fine enough job if you have something wrong to be able to go in and get diagnosed. And obviously not everyone's experience is ideal, but what seems completely missing is a, you know, health care, something like what you're providing, where you go in, you talk about the things that you're not, are not feeling great or the things you'd like optimize. And a doctor can help you move the needle in a positive direction, as opposed to just, you know, downside mitigation. I want to ask just maybe two closing questions and then we'll wrap up. And this is one of those interviews where you've been amazing and I, you know, could talk with you for another hour, but I want to be respectful of your time. The first question I would ask is just, what do you feel like as you look back at the last two years of building this business, what do you feel are the biggest lessons that you've learned? And these may be ones that were especially painful. These may be ones that, uh, you know, you guys, you, you did something right from day one and didn't really know why, but you lucked out. What are some of those big key lessons you feel like you've learned building Hone so far? If I had known how difficult this business was going to be to build going into it, I probably, I don't know if I wouldn't have built it. I would have thought a lot harder, right? I actually paused for five months building the company because I was afraid of the the legal and compliance and regulatory challenges around it. And we, we brought in the best counsel in the country. It's Nate Lockman from Foley. And I felt comfortable there. But what I... I think we got lucky. And honestly, there's so much luck in this journey. One of my co-founders, he specializes in building, I would say, very complex software for really, I'd say, difficult businesses. And what we had to spend so much time doing was being part of the business ourselves on a daily basis, helping with the patients ourselves directly. 
and basically making sure that as we learn how to do something manually, and right there is something we would do 1500 times manually, you then build the technology solution and then you got to test the hell out of it and then build the next manual thing. And I think that a lot of people, when they come into telehealth, they think, oh, I'm just going to go pull an EMR off the shelf. I'm going to use someone like true pill to get my meds and I'm going to paste it together via API. I'm just going to push patients through the experience and spend some money on Facebook. That's not healthcare. That's bullshit. I, mean, I don't mean to say that like that, like they're providing good, they're providing good and they're helping patients. But the reality is that you're not creating anything that's differentiated. That's going to stand the test of time. And someone's going to come eat your lunch because you haven't done anything different. That's difficult. And I'd say now going through it, when people tell us they're coming, they're going to build a testosterone company, I say, listen, God bless you. Go for it. Like you have no clue what you're signing up for. And I think it was really having founders and a team that is so mission driven that we were like, hell or high water, we're going to figure this thing out. I'll tell you, there was a, there was a time when we were selling a lot of testosterone during COVID and our pharmacy came to us and they said, you broke us. And you're like, what do you mean we broke you? And like, well, we can't sell you any more testosterone because we've never had someone order so much this quickly. And we're like, why didn't you tell us that before? That's that's crazy. And they're like, well, we didn't know. And so here you are about to run out of testosterone. You've got like at this early point in time, 1,500 patients. You're like, well, shit, how do, I, how do I solve this problem? And everyone just jumped in. They j- picked up the phones and we called 1,500 patients, apologized profusely, found another pharmacy, and then finally got the products to them. And I'd say the other really important thing is if you truly are dedicated to patient care, the single most important insight that we've realized is all you have to do is get your patients' medications on time every single month. Nothing else matters. I'll tell you, nothing else matters. And during COVID and when you're scaling at a relatively rapid clip, it's really hard to do perfectly. And so what I would say, the other thing that we learned the hard way is you can't just have one supplier, can't just have one EMR, can't just have one blood testing lab. You've got to create redundancy in your business and you've got to figure out how to shift the redundancy relatively fast. And you've got to create a culture that actually is capable of doing that. Um, And then I'd probably say like the other thing that I wish we had known going into this is that when you have a business that has multiple blood tests and requires them every 90 days, assume each of those transitory points are a funnel in themselves. And you need someone to babysit each one of those funnels and make sure they're helping patients get all the way through because that's where you actually can lose the entire business. So that'd probably be the other really big learning that we got. Those are amazing. Uh, Final question would be, you know, just to, so we talked about the lessons you learned uh, as a business. I would love to talk about the lessons that you've learned as a CEO. You know, this is your third company that you're building with Hone. Um, It sounds like it's probably the hardest (laughs) in terms of challenges that you've taken on. What do you feel like you've learned and how have you grown building this business over the last two years? I'd say that the first company I built, I wasn't secure enough with hiring people that were better than I was, and I didn't actively seek them out. And when people say like a good CEO basically works himself out of a job and spends 30 or 40% of his time recruiting, I thought that was like a cute kitchen magnet that really probably wasn't real. Um, and the reality is like, it actually couldn't be more true. And I think that the, the way I've grown is, I've been really grateful and blessed to have like an unbelievable founding team. And these guys are all killers. And then the next next category, I'd say like next crop of talent we brought in, all super mission driven. They cared about the customers so much. And frankly, like when I find someone that's smarter than I am, that's more intelligent, and I think that can do a great job, I beg them to come work for us. And the other really important thing is I make sure I'm really involved strategically. I've got my I've got my hands in everything at the beginning. And the moment I realize they're good, I pull back, pull back and say, go ahead, do it. And let's make sure that we, we have a conversation. And I'm deeply operational with the next problem we're solving. And that's kind of like, I'd say that my work style is, is I want to make sure I understand the business. I can do it myself. I'm going to find someone better than I am, staff it up, and then move away and make sure you keep an eye on it. I say the, the other thing too is, I don't think that I was ever so intentional about a culture. And when we transitioned into this kind of like post COVID world where everyone was 100% virtual, it was unclear to me how we would create a group of people that cared about the same thing. And I think we spent a ton of time and effort figuring that thing out. And, you know, I'll say that this week was probably the single most important 
proof point of that where my father unfortunately passed away about 10 days ago. And so it was the first time I actually just stepped out of the business. I said, look, I got to handle my family stuff. I want to honor my father the right way. I want to make sure my mother is happy. My brother sees a good example. And I said, guys, you just got to take care of the shop. Right. And I came back 10 days later and the damn thing's running better than when I left it. <laughs> so I'd say like that is that is two the two most important things in learning is I think I had I mean, all the other operational stuff and right, like I could sit here and say I'm really smart. I'm not. Honestly, it's like I just got really intelligent people that have helped us build the business. It's the perfect note to end on. Uh, this has been so much fun, Saad. I mean, I know that this is one of the interviews that I'm going to be playing back. And I mean, so many of the ideas you shared, the little quotes um, have been amazing. So I'm deeply grateful for the time. Thank you so much for coming on Outlier Academy. Yeah, Daniel, thank you so much. I appreciate you and all your listeners for giving me the chance.